Hey guys, good morning. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Daniel Rosal here, bringing you today's video from my home office here in the lovely city of Jerusalem. And uh, this video is going to be a little bit different than my usual uh, videos that I've been posting here up on YouTube for, you know, a couple of years. And I talk in my office into the microphone. Uh, I'm going to be posting this on my podcast as well. So after I finish this video, I will be extracting the audio and putting it up on the podcast. What is this podcast you speak of? I hear you ask. I have a podcast and it's called the Daniel Rosehill Podcast. The weird thing is I've, for the last couple of years, uh, whenever I've been talking to clients or going into job interviews and people put your name into Google, everyone finds the podcast. And I don't know why, because it's been like three years since I uploaded anything to the podcast and my YouTube channel is much more active. But for whatever reason, people seem to occasionally stumble across my podcast. So it's been on my to-do list for a while to actually renew the podcast, uh, especially because I'm currently going through a podcast watching phase. So this is going to be an, ex an experiment. Instead of recording a podcast with just voice, I'm putting up a YouTube vlog or video blog or video podcast, whatever you want to call this. And then I'll be, you know, taking the audio out, which is really, really simple to do. I'm putting that up and making it available as a podcast. Now I have, I'm, so because this is going to be a long form video, I'm going to give myself liberty to go on weird tangents because that's how I naturally speak. My brain is a little bit scattered. Uh, I think I've talked about before how I believe that in the future, I call it the format, the coming age of format agnostic content. It sounds a bit like kind of religion. I'm trying to evangelize people too but i believe that content right now we're, we're living in the era of a content surface there's way 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 too much content out there on the internet for most people to even be able to curate or make sense of um but it's all kind of scattered it's very hard some people th there's content uh, available as audio podcasts there's youtubers there's udemy courses there's books there's ebooks and people tend to stick to their lane. So YouTubers will do their YouTube videos and podcasters will do their audio podcasts and bloggers will do their blogs. And actually doesn't really make sense because most people who are interested in a topic or interested in a topic or, you know, someone's thoughts, they get interested in, you know, David McWilliams, who's an Irish economist who I listen to on his podcast. So they're not really interested in the medium, video, audio, writing. They're interested in the topic and the person and right now the way we normatively deliver content doesn't reflect that people are in channels right and if you want to like listen to your favorite youtuber in audio you have to do weird things like extract the audio or pay for youtube premium by the way which i've been doing for four months and i think it's one of the last bargains on the internet it's really really worth it if you're an avid youtube consumer and i definitely consider myself an avid youtube watcher I'm going to just have a sip of water. Um, so yeah, the way content is delivered doesn't really make a ton of sense, but that's the way it is right now. But in any event, the thought I wanted to conclude is that I believe very soon in the future, we will be arriving at a point in time in which because these technologies for uh, creating video from text and going from video to audio to text, which is um, automatic transcription are very mature soon everyone will be creating videos but it'll be simplistic to push out that video as a podcast or automatically generated as a blog so that's my prediction and uh so that's uh, so uh the long neglected daniel rosal podcast will be getting a new lease of life by me automatically converting these youtube videos into a uh, podcast format so that if people prefer to catch me there, they are they will be at liberty to do so. Now on to the actual topic of the video. So um, I woke up this morning. You know when you wake up with those feelings that there, you know there's something on your chest that you need to get off your chest before you kind of proceed with your day as usual. So I had that kind of feeling when I woke up about ten minutes ago. I'm recording this at about seven thirty in the morning here in Israel, and I, I went to Tel Aviv on business a couple of days ago. And this isn't something uh, very exciting or out of the ordinary for me. I live in Jerusalem, but um, I've been working in what Israelis call the high-tech world for the past number of years. Now, I do my high-tech, in quotation marks, 
because I don't think it's a good description. It's what Israelis call the technology sector, right? Or the what what in Ireland we call IT, information technology. But Israelis love the word high tech, so it's kind of caught on. So I've been working in high tech for the past few years, whether in house in companies or right now. Um, my major client, which is actually kind of like a full time job, but that's a, that's a story for another day. It's based in Tel Aviv. I rarely work with people in Jerusalem. So I'm usually in Tel Aviv, if not once per week for business, once every second week for business. And I meet people. I go, I have meetings with clients. I talk to them, whatever. And maybe it's because I was out of Israel for a few weeks this summer. And I've kind of come, you always come back with a slightly different perspective on things. But um, I, so I was, I was having coffee with someone and they said, you know, we're getting to know each other on a more personal level. And they said, oh, why, why do you live in Jerusalem? Why don't you live in Tel Aviv? We're having this conversation in a coffee shop in Tel Aviv. And I did my usual thing, which is like when someone asks, when someone phrases a question like that, it may, you auto, your, your automatic reaction is to kind of retreat a bit, right? And you kind of puts you on the defensive. It's like someone saying, you have a meeting in New York City, you're from Iowa, and they say, why do you live in Iowa? Like, why, why wouldn't you live in New York City? So it's kind of that dynamic. Or in the Irish context, why, why do you live in uh, the middle of the countryside? Why don't you live in Cork or Dublin? So after that meeting, it kind of, it kind of left me feeling a little bit, you know, I need to start defending if I want to live in Jerusalem. And I've been doing that for the past eight years since I moved here from Ireland. I, I should own that decision. I don't need to feel defensive or apologetic about it when I'm meeting with people. Now, the type of, it's usually a quite homogenous uh, type of people that ask these questions. It's people who live in Tel Aviv and they tend to live and breathe the kind of Tel Aviv ecosystem of startups and that. And I always say, yeah, you know, I like living in Jerusalem, but maybe Tel Aviv would probably be better for my professional life. And we might move there in a few years and we're thinking about it. And you know what I mean? All these kind of like excuses a little bit. And so anyway, I thought this morning I had my coffee and I realized what was on my mind and that was what was on my mind. So I posted in a uh, Facebook group called Secret Jerusalem. And I said, folks, what, what, how, how do you handle that question? When people ask, it's always Tel Aviv people asking people in Jerusalem and they always ask it in a certain way as well. It's always, it's never like, oh, I'm, I'm interested to hear what, what, why do you live in Jerusalem? It's more like, why do you live in Jerusalem? Do you know what I mean? The difference is in the body language or the tone of voice. So as we speak, as I speak, answers are flowing into that uh, Facebook thread. But as that's happening, I thought I would give my own heartfelt reasons about why. I'm not saying, see, the thing is, what, what I take issue with when people in Tel Aviv say, why do you live in Jerusalem is... I, I don't care where anyone lives. I, I don't care that people in Tel Aviv live in Tel Aviv or people in a live in a ladder or people in Taiwan live in Taiwan. Whatever people live, it's fine. But people in Tel Aviv have this weird bee in their bonnet that if you live in Israel, you must live in Tel Aviv. And I think it's stupid. So instead of going anti-Tel Aviv, because there are ways we can attack Tel Aviv, I want to be pro-Jerusalem and explain what's good about this city that it's worth living here. And by the way, final point before I do that, it's not. it's actually not only people in Tel Aviv or in Israel asking, why don't you live in Tel Aviv? When I do Zoom, I also do Zoom calls as well as business, in-person business meetings. Very, uh, very diverse life I'm living here. And, you know, um, it's not always transparent that I live in Israel from my business website, my professional materials. So, you know, people, you, you open up the conversation and people say, uh, oh, and uh, where are you based, Daniel? And you say, Oh, I live in Israel. And there's always that kind of moment where you're waiting for people to go, oh, or say something. Or you can sometimes, if it's video, you can see their eyes darting left and right as they're like waiting for a, waiting to think of some kind of suitable reaction. Um, and sometimes people do, but they always go, oh, yeah, I was in Tel Aviv. It was really cool. You live in Tel Aviv, right? And you're like, ah, uh, no, I live in Jerusalem. And then you you can kind of almost like picture going through their minds like you in the like old city of Jerusalem and like carrying a Torah scroll or like something from the biblical era. You can almost picture that. So it's not only people from Israel, it's also people from outside of Israel who assume for whatever reason, if you live in Israel, you must live in Tel Aviv. 
And I think this actually speaks to a marketing problem that we have in Jerusalem. I'm talking honestly here. If pe people don't think you can live in Jerusalem, Jerusalem's association in international eyes is with the old city of Jerusalem. Now, here's an interesting fact about living in Jerusalem that people may not know. My contention would be, and I think I'm 99% sure I'm right about this, most people who live in Jerusalem do not visit the old city of Jerusalem that regularly. And I think there's a, both a symbolic reason for that. You, we, we realize it's a special place. And there's also just a pragmatic reason for that. And that's that, like, your day-to-day -day life in Jerusalem, you're working a job, you're doing your shopping, you're going to the post office. There, are, You don't really have reason to go into the old city. There's just some historical tourist sites. And I, I would imagine if you ask most people living in Manhattan, how often do you visit the Empire State Building or the Statue of Liberty? You'd probably get a similar answer. And they'd say that's a tourist site. We don't been there, sure. Go there now and again, sure. But I don't really go there day to day. So... Um, there's this kind of, I guess, impression on the part of the world that Jerusalem, the Tel Aviv is so glitzy and glamorous and Jerusalem is unfortunately, and this is actually true, economically speaking, Jerusalem is way behind Tel Aviv. Um, Israel is Jerusalem's capital city or not recognized internationally as such, I hasten to add. Hence, most embassies are not in Jerusalem, with a few examples. Hence why locating embassies in Jerusalem is such a big deal, which is tells you a lot, because usually putting, if you're a foreign country, putting your embassy in the capital of, that, of the host country, that's where you put your embassy. Yet, we know there's an American embassy in Jerusalem and Honduras, and it makes the news and there's opening ceremonies. Why? Because it's politically contentious. Um... So Israel, Jerusalem is Israel's capital, where the where its government is, whatever. But it's not it's not really its capital. Now I know that there's a word for this. It's not coming to me. Tel Aviv is really functions like the capital in terms of being the socioeconomic hub of the country. Tel Aviv is the cultural heart. Is probably fair to say of Israel. Debatable that point. People might debate me if anyone actually watches this video. But when, if you spend half a day in Jerusalem and half a day in Tel Aviv, when you come from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, if it's your first time visiting Israel, you'll get to you'll get from Jerusalem. You'll say, "Oh, I don't think Jerusalem was like this. It's kind of a small, pretty low-level town, four stories, one little kind of high high street called Ben Yehuda Street." I mean, the old city is amazing, but the rest of Jerusalem, you kind of say, it "Didn't really feel like a capital city of a million people." Then you get to Tel Aviv and that and the skyscrapers and you'd say, wow, no, no, no. Tel Aviv is is really where Israel's at. Right. So that's the impression most people would form justifiably. Now, they're, from an employment standpoint, they're correct. There just aren't that many jobs in Jerusalem. There are government jobs. Uh, like if you work for the state, there's more jobs in Jerusalem than Tel Aviv. But if you work in the private sector and most, you know, um, people working in technology, perhaps because I work in the tech field uh, and I'm young-ish, sort of 33. And people assume if you're young, you're working in tech, you want to, you don't want to work in the second rate city, you want to work in the economic hub. So therefore you must be in Tel Aviv because that's where the startups are. Now, I have a couple of thoughts about why Jerusalem still is a good place to live. First thing to say is that Jerusalem is a livable city. When people think of Jerusalem, the old city, that is a part of Jerusalem. It's not the whole city. There are jobs in Jerusalem. There are a couple of high-tech parks, uh, which is, again, using that weird high-tech word. There's one in Malka, one in Har Chodzvim, uh, a couple more. And it's true that we're far behind Tel Aviv, but it's catching up, I would like to think. Or at least there are jobs in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem. Now, the second thing about this, and the main reason I live in Jerusalem and it's going to come back to it's going to come very quickly to religious uh, reasoning and that's why by the way i'm wearing this goofy baseball cap because it's uh, a period in judaism called the nine days before tisha b'av and during this day during this nine day period you're not supposed to uh, cut your hair now i came back from the u.s two or three weeks ago and my dear wife says it's Tisha B'Av in a few days. So I said, oh, Tisha B'Av is about in a few days. So I can't, I can't get a haircut. I can't eat meat. 
Turns out it wasn't Tisha B'Av for another 10 days. So I've been actually observing the pre Tisha B'Av period for a fortnight now. And hence my hair has grown from, it's grown a bit out of control. Um, but that's speaking to religious observance and it provides a nice segue to, uh, to that. So my Zionism personally, my philosophical belief about why, you know, the Jews coming back to Israel, reinvigorating their homeland. To me, it's based upon them being Jews and keeping Judaism. And that means some level of religious observance. And in Jerusalem, it inspires me much more to see people living holy. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean holy, H-O-L-Y. I mean W-H-O-L-E-Y, as in fully integrated Jewish lives. And they're able to do that in Jerusalem without there being any sort of middle ground or conflict between what they do for a living and their life as a observant Jew. In other words, they're a bus driver for, and they're Jewish. And, and in Tel Aviv, so that's, that's what I see, I see in Jerusalem. I see, you know, guys dressed in the full Hasidic or Haredi garb and they're, you know, driving taxis or they're working as programmers or they're working as yoga instructors. And you're like, oh, that's really cool. That excites me much more than Tel Aviv, which is by contrast to Jerusalem, a secular city. And I kind of think, well, it's just a, you've got all the problems of Israel, the crazy cost of living, the chaos. But if you're taking the religious aspect out of it, what's even the point? It's like, it's like being, you know, if you want to have a secular life, um, a secular city, you could live in London or Berlin. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying I dislike Tel Aviv at all, which is because I don't I actually think it's a really cool city just crazy expensive and crazy hot in the summer and there's a lot of cockroaches but besides that it's super cool it's very vibrant so it's not for me that i don't want to live in tel aviv it's more that jerusalem speaks much more to my concept of what a city in the state of israel should look like now it's not always uh it's not always um it's not always wonderful that 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 religiosity i must say and it can be really challenging i moved from living in a place called Cork in Ireland as pretty much the one of the only Jewish families, like maybe one of two, no Jews at all, no kosher food, not even a functioning synagogue for the last few years. It's not closed since, but whatever. And I moved to like the Jewish capital of the world. It was like a zero to 100 acceleration. And given that fact has actually been pretty seamless. Being in a religious Jewish city doesn't really... It, even though I'm not, you know, fully 100% the most religious person you'll meet, it gets, it can be difficult in the winter when um, uh, Shabbat comes in on Friday and starts stuff closing at one or two or three o'clock. And that can be a little bit tedious, but you figure out after a number of years living in Jerusalem, you figure out workarounds, you know, that you have to do your groceries early on a Friday. You know, it's always a good idea to have the pantry stocked up because maybe you're sick and you didn't get out in time whatever so you figure it out and there's a certain rhythm there's the rhythm to the week here is a bit is it just it's round it centers around shabbat the sabbath uh the sabbat the shabbat people start preparing for it on a during the week thursday is the big night out friday is a leisure day but it's also preparing for shabbat saturday shabbat saturday night is motzei shabbat when shabbat goes out and it kind of becomes a second social night and then the week starts again. Other reasons I like living in Jerusalem. So besides, so there is what we have so far is the the fact that it's a religious city. And for me, as someone who does actually keep kosher, even though you might think, how can you keep kosher and not be religious? Standards in Israel for religiosity or what's considered religious, which in Hebrew is dati, are very high. So by that standard, the fact that I don't wear a head covering besides this period, it's my goofy baseball cap, already kind of puts me out of the religious bracket and the minds of a lot of people, unfortunately. I say unfortunately because I think judging people's level of religiosity by outward signs is stupid. But anyway, um, so there's the fact that Jerusalem is religious and it's accommodating to religious people. So if I want to keep kosher food, which I do, in Jerusalem it's easy. In Tel Aviv, it's like when you're in New York or Ireland and you have a list of kosher restaurants or a list of kosher things you can buy in a supermarket. This is how it works in Ireland. The rabbi, the chief rabbinate publishes a kosher list and you say, oh, I want this. Oh, I want that. Oh, no, no, it's not kosher. I can't have that. 
So it's kind of like the diaspora experience of Judaism, which is eat in one of these few restaurants, live in one of these few establishments. And Judaism is something that you need. It's like a narrow box that you need to go into kind of away from society. And what I like about Jerusalem is that the, as I said before, sort of a slightly different point when I was talking about people's jobs, the religiousness is integrated into the life of the city. If you live in West Jerusalem, it's normal to be religious. The city accommodates you, etc. So let's move on from the religion point. Um, I think Jerusalem's a nice city. That's point number two. I'm not saying Tel Aviv. I don't, this isn't about bashing Tel Aviv, even though people in Tel Aviv tend to bash Jerusalem. I'm not trying to return fire here. I'm trying to be positive and say what's good about Jerusalem. I'm, I'm just going to pause this video for a second or stop speaking while I have half a caffeine pill because I'm currently waking up. Um, okay, one sec, I need to do this. Okay. Um, where were we? Jerusalem. Ah, yes. So I think Jerusalem's a nice city. It's a nice, um, Jerusalem traditionally has sort of this reputation in Israel of being a poor city, of being a very religious city. And those kind of, people assume they go hand in hand because a lot of the ultra-religious sector in Israel, the Haredi sector doesn't participate in the labor market voluntarily. I would like to say that's changing. The demographics of Jerusalem are very interesting. It's about split between East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem. I've talked about this in blogs before. Kind of function as separate cities de facto, if you want to use that word. Different bus networks, different hospital networks. Very little real integration in my opinion. So I like to think of Jerusalem, not as one city, but as three cities. West Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, and Haredi Jerusalem, ultra-Orthodox Jerusalem. And I, they've even got three downtowns. West Jerusalem centers on Ben Yehuda Street, that area. Haredi Jerusalem centers on, uh, there's a street running through Me'a Shaharim, and all those neighborhoods around it are also very religious. And East Jerusalem centers on um, Damascus Gate, and... Uh, that commercial area called Babel Zahra in that little area of Jerusalem there. So Jerusalem is really three cities conjoined. But even, even so, I think West Jerusalem, when I talk about Jerusalem as a normative Jewish immigrant to Israel, I hasten to add that I'm talking about West Jerusalem. That's the, that's the one of three Jerusalem cities that I live in. So West Jerusalem is a nice city, in my opinion. It's um, You've got variety. You've got some kind of classical neighborhoods like uh, Rehavia, the German colony over there. There is um, land owned by the Russian church. There is land owned by the Greek patriarch. So grand kind of church buildings and church owned property. There is downtown, which is kind of understated for a downtown area. What I like about Jerusalem is that it has one of everything. So by, by that I mean you know, as, as, a, as a guy into video, there's a couple of camera stores. There's a DJ store, which has pretty decent audio equipment. There aren't tons of bars or a raring nightlife scene. And people will tell you the Shook is a big nightlife venue. This is one thing I don't like about what's the changes in Jerusalem I've witnessed. And that's that the Shook, which is Shuk Mahane Yehuda, which is a big vegetable market. Amazing, amazing place. And it has opened a nightlife front for the past, like... 10 years it became a nightlife venue i think that's great amazing idea to you know by to convert a vegetable market into a bar district at night time the the problem i see is that it's become the venues that have opened are really kind of places where 18 year olds have taken over for drinking and every bar blasts really loud music and there's no coordination it's kind of people seem to like that but i think it's i think it could be done much more tactfully much more nicely perhaps a few more adult-oriented bars here, by which I mean places for folks in their 30s or 20s, a couple of those teenage places where people just want to blast trashy music, but keep them a little bit separated. But anyway, I, I, I digress. So there isn't a wild nightlife scene in Jerusalem, but there's a couple of good bars. And something I've learned about living in Jerusalem over the years, or learned about myself, is that I only need a couple of good bars. I'm 33, I'm not 18, I'm not looking for kind of wild to go on wild benders so i like a couple of decent craft beer bars where i can sit down and talk to friends i only need a couple of friends 
another thing I'm learning about myself as I uh, progress through my 30s is it's friendships are a uh, quality over quantity thing. And there's everything in Jerusalem I need. There's uh, minus Indian food, minus Indian meat food. There is an Indian place uh, in Jerusalem, but uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be there. It, it, it's, 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 it's not really my scene. Um, so an Indian restaurant would be great. But there's a Persian restaurant. There's one. There's great Ethiopian restaurants. So there's one of everything. Anyway, I feel like I'm going into the kind of rambling territory here. I've gone from sharing actual insights about Jerusalem to just talking and boring people and i see that the timer is clocking up on 30 minutes here so let me wrap things up really i think jerusalem's a really nice city it's a viable city to live in and here's one more point i do want i do want to tack into this video blog slash podcast and that's that tel aviv is so close we can accept that tel aviv is a great city and it's literally in the grand scheme of things, that high-speed train connecting Jerusalem and Tel Aviv is amazing. It's such a good piece of infrastructure. It takes about 30 minutes, and it's it's 30 minutes to get from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem now, and it's a game-changer. So um, people from Tel Aviv look at you like you've got two heads and say, why, why do you live in Jerusalem? They're the ones who have two heads because uh, the new era is remote work. It's amazing. I love remote working. And you can work with a company in Tel Aviv and visit their office once a week or work with clients in Tel Aviv or work with clients not in Israel and get into Tel Aviv. So it's actually have to, 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 to have that mind frame that you need to live right in the center of the crazy, crazy unaffordable housing and the crazy cost of living is actually a backward way of thinking. It's like saying, it's like people saying, you know, you have to live in Manhattan. I'm like, yeah, maybe before the pandemic, when the only way to access that labor market was by actually working on site, not anymore. So I would say that living in Jerusalem and working in Tel Aviv or with Tel Aviv companies and getting your exposure to the international labor market and the better conditions and the better pay and um, sort of circuit working around the fact that there isn't so many companies in Jerusalem is a more forward approach than feeling you have to live in the center of Tel Aviv and paying your 8,000 shackles a month to live in a shoebox. So, yeah, I actually believe in this is... Okay, fi final thought I want to get in. Jerusalem is... Jerusalem's best days are ahead of it. The city is currently working hard. It's a bit of a mess here right now. They're digging up in every street corner and it's very frustrating and there's traffic jams and people are getting annoyed about living in Jerusalem. And justifiably, I think the municipality has not struck a good balance between the needs of local residents and the needs of future residents and the needs of foreigners. By which I mean, they're building a lot of luxury housing for people who only visit the city one or two weeks a year. They're building Jerusalem with this grand vision of we're building Jerusalem and it's gonna be the capital and people are gonna be able to live in Jerusalem, which is great. What about people living in Jerusalem right now who have to put up with the traffic jams and noise pollution required by that grand aspiration? Seems to have fallen by the wayside a bit. Um, so right now, Jerusalem's in a bit of a mess. And there's been articles about it in the Jerusalem Post and also in Hebrew. It's been noticed, let's say. And I think the current administration and the Jerusalem municipality has not struck the right balance between those two dynamics. The need to build Jerusalem and the need to make it a livable good city for people who are living there right now and paying taxes to it. I think it's fallen down in that respect. But nevertheless, that work they're putting into Jerusalem will come to fruition. They are expanding the light rail network. They're putting in a couple more light rails. And that's really the way forward. It's in Jerusalem, if I can say one criticism of the city, it's been too slow to embrace stuff like micro mobility, to put down proper bike lanes. Tel Aviv and all things sustainable and future oriented is doing a better job than Jerusalem. And Jerusalem needs to catch up badly. It needs to increase buses it needs to put down more bike lanes it needs to move away from private car ownership because it's completely unsustainable in a city like jerusalem and the city's built around cars so there's work to be done but when all these magnificent changes come to their fruition which will happen talpiot which is a kind of run down neighborhood in south jerusalem it's really industrial place and there's grand visions to turn talpiot into a southern center of Jerusalem, which will be quite exciting. It'll be the southern, you'll have the southern core of Jerusalem, the center core of Jerusalem, and the old city. It'll be make it more vibrant. And with all those train links, 
you'll be able to just hop between trains and get all the way around the city. So I truly believe Jerusalem's best days are ahead of it. If I could say what if if I were mayor of Jerusalem, and by the way, this isn't a attempt to get into politics. I have no aspiration to be in politics and my Hebrew is frankly not good enough. But if I were to be the mayor of Jerusalem or a politician in Jerusalem tomorrow, I'd say the number one priority for Jerusalem right now besides has to be two things one quality of life and reducing the construction chaos and two jobs the city just needs jobs 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 will bring prosperity people to the city increase people's disposable income and that'll kind of uh take jerusalem out of its i don't think jerusalem has to choose between being a religious center with a religious religiously observant population and socioeconomic development it can be well developed with a good local economy and religious i don't think it needs to choose uh between those two ways of life for that's my contention anyway we got past the 30 minute time and i'm running out of steam so i'm going to wrap up this uh first vlog here i will put a link to my podcast in the video description as i mentioned it's going to be going up there to reinvigorate the daniel rosal podcast this has been me daniel rosal speaking into my microphone for the past 30 minutes at about 8 30 in the morning on a thursday here in jerusalem for anyone who's made it all the way through this 30 minute rant, no cheating. I'm not thanking you if you skipped ahead. But if you really stuck stuck with me all the way for the past half hour, thank you very much for watching, listening. Feel free to uh, leave a comment with your thoughts if you have any in response to these thoughts. And until the next video, if you want to get more videos from this YouTube channel about living in Israel, Jerusalem, uh, technology and other subjects, please consider subscribing. Thank you for watching and have a very good day.